Three years have gone by. Yes, the sun has come up over a thousand times. Summers and winters have cracked the mountain a little bit more, and some rain has brought down some of the dirt. Some babies that weren't even born before begun talking in regular sentences already. And a number of people who thought they were right young and spry noticed they can't bound up a flight of stairs like they used to without their hearts fluttering a little. All that can happen in a thousand days. Nature's been pushing and contriving in other ways too. A number of young people fell in love and got married. Yes, the mountain's been a bit away a few fractions of an inch. Millions of gallons of water went by the mill. And here and there a new home was set up under a roof. Almost everybody in the world gets married. You know what I mean. In our town, there aren't hardly any exceptions. Almost everybody in the world climbs into their graves married. The first act was called the daily life. This act is called love and marriage. And there's another act coming after this. And I reckon you can guess what that's about. So, it's three years later, 1904, July 7th, just after high school commencement. That's the time when most of our young people jump up and get married. As soon as they pass their last examinations in solid geometry and Cicero's orations, it looks like they suddenly feel themselves fit to be married. It's early morning. Only this time, it's been raining. It's been pouring and thundering. Mrs. Gibbs' garden and Mrs. Webb's here are drenched. All those bean poles and pea vines are drenched. And all yesterday over there on Main Street, the rain looked like curtains being blown along. Hmm. May begin again any minute. There you hear the 545 from Boston. And there's Mrs. Gibbs and Mrs. Webb come downstairs to fix breakfast just as though it were an ordinary day. I don't have to point out to the women in this audience that those ladies that they see before them, both of those ladies cook three meals a day, one for 20 years and the other one for 40, and no summer vacation. They raised two children apiece, washed and cleaned the house, and they never had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> It's like one of those Middle West poets said, you've got to love life to have life. And you've got to have life to love life. It's what they call a vicious circle. Here comes Howie Newsom delivering the milk. And there's side crawl delivering the papers like his brother before him. Morning, Howie. Morning, Si. Anything papers I don't know about? Oh, nothing much. Except for losing about the best baseball pitcher for which Corn's ever had, George Gibbs. I suppose he is. He could hit on bases too. Yeah, he's a mighty fine ball player. Whoa, hasn't he? Guess I can stop and talk if I want to. I don't see how we could give up a thing like that. Just to get married? Would you, Howie? I can't tell, so I never had you tell it that way. Morning. Good morning, Howie. You have really built? Yeah, it's time to see what I can do to prevent a flood. Rising all night. Sign so Cole's all worked up here about George Gibb retiring from baseball. Yes, sir. Uh, that's the way it goes. I'm getting 84 when we had a ball plant. Inside, even George Gibbs couldn't touch it. Name of Hank Tom. Went down the main. Yeah, I was just telling 
them will disappear, just to how we like that. Uh, Mrs. Lewis is going to tell you that we both will be very happy, Mrs. Webb. We know they will. Well, thank you, and thank Mrs. Newsom, and we'll count on seeing you at the wedding. Yes, ma'am. We'll get there. Who is that?
Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, I, I never thought of that before. But girls have to be a mite nervous on her wedding day. Yeah. You know, I, I just wish a fellow could get married without all that marching up and down, you know? Every man that's ever lived has felt that way about it, George. <laughs> but it hasn't been any use. It's the women who have built the weddings for the boy. For a while now, the women have it all their own. You know, a man looks pretty small at a wedding, George. All those good women standing shoulder to shoulder, making sure the knot's tied in a mighty public way. But you believe in it, don't you, Mr. Webb? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Don't you misunderstand me, my boy. Marriage is a wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. And don't you forget that, George. No, sir. Mr. Webb, uh, how old are you when you got married? Well, you see, I've been to college. Time to get settled. But Mrs. Webb, she wasn't much older than what Emily is. Age hasn't much to do with it, George. Not compared to what other things. What were you going to say, Mrs. Webb? Oh, I don't know. Was I going to say something? George, I was thinking the other night about some advice my father gave me when I got married. Charles, he said, Charles, start out early showing who's boss. Best thing to do is to give an order, even if it doesn't make sense, just so you learn to obey. And he said, if anything about your wife irritates you, her conversation, or anything, just get up and leave the house. That will make you her. And, oh yes, he said, never, never let your wife know how much money you have. Never. Mr. Webb, I don't think I could possibly be treated. <laughs> So I took the opposite of my father's advice, and I've been happy ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and let that be a lesson to George, never to ask advice on personal matters. <laughs> Say, Bob, if I'm a little late to practice, just start without 
this year, Emily. I don't like the whole change that's come over you in the past year, George. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, but I've got to tell the truth and shame the devil. Change? What, what do you mean? Well, up to a year ago, I used to like you a lot. I used to watch you as you did everything, and because we've been friends for so long, and then you began spending all your time at baseball, and you never stopped to speak to anybody, not even your own family you didn't. Oh, and it's fact, George. You got awful stuck up and conceited, and all the girls say so. They may not say so to your face, but that's what they say behind your back. It makes me sad to hear them say it. But I've got to agree with them a little. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, but I can't be sorry that I said it. I said it, Emily. I never thought that such a thing was happening. I guess it's hard for a fellow not to have a few folks creep into his character. I always expect a man to be perfect, and I think that he should be. <laughs> oh. Well, I don't think it's possible to be perfect, Emily. Well, my father is. And as far as I can see, your father is, so I don't see why I you shouldn't be, too. <laughs> well, I think it's the other way around. Men aren't actually good, but girls are. You, you might as well know right now that I'm not perfect. No, because it's harder for girls to be perfect as a man. Because we girls are more, more, more nervous. Oh my, now I'm sorry I said all that. I don't know what made me say it. Emily. No, now I can see that it's not the truth at all. And suddenly it doesn't seem so important. Emily. Do you want to get an ice cream soda or something? Before you go home? No. Why, thank you, I would. Hello, Stu. Good afternoon, Mrs. Sulkin. I made a 
father, I, I ask him if he thinks it's important to go to school to be a good father. My George. Yeah. And sometimes they even say it's a waste of time. I mean, you, you can get all that information anyways from the pamphlets the government sends out. And Uncle Luke's getting old. He's about ready for me to start taking him to the farm tomorrow if I can. Mom. And like you say, being gone all that time, meeting other people, gosh. I mean, if anything like that could happen to me, I don't want to go away. You know, I, I bet new people aren't any better than old people. I bet they almost never are. Emily. I feel that you're about as good as the friends I've got. I don't want to go to other towns and meet other people. But maybe it's very important for you to learn all that about cattle judging and soils. Of course, I don't know. Emily, I'm going to make up my mind right now. I'm not going to go. I'm going to tell my pa about it tonight. George, I don't see why you have to decide right now. It's a year away. Emily, I'm glad you spoke to me about that. That flaw in my character. What you said was right, but there's one thing wrong. And that was when you said for a year I was losing people in. You, for instance. Sure. I always thought of you as one of the chief people I think about. I, I always made sure where you're sitting on the bleachers at end, who you were with. And for three days now, I've been trying to walk you home, but something always got in the way. Oh. I, just yesterday, I was over against the wall, and we walked home with Mrs. Corcoran. George, life's awful funny. How could I have known that? I, I thought that you were scared. Emily, I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to go to school. I feel that once you found somebody that you bond with, I mean, who's fond of you too and cares enough about your character, I think that's just as important as school is. Even more so. That's what I think. I think it's awfully important, too. <clears throat> yes, George? If I do make a big change, could you be... Would you be... I am now. <clears throat> conversation we've been having. Yes. <laughs> yes. Just wait one minute and I'll lock you home, okay? Uh, this morning, um, I, I have to go home to get the money to pay. What's that, George Gibbs? Are you trying to tell yes, me? Yes, sir. I, I have reasons. Look, look this morning. Here's my gold watch. You keep it until I come back, okay? That's all right, George. You keep your watch. I trust you. I'll be back in five minutes. I'll trust you ten years, George. Not a day over. <laughs> you got all of your shotgun, Lee. Oh, yes, 